Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Grubb. I'm a reporter with GamesBeat. Uh, it's a division of VentureBeat. I write about games. Um, you might know Dean Takahashi. I do all the work he doesn't want to do. Um, we're going to talk about esports and indie development and uh, how they can work together, how maybe they're not working together. Uh, before we start, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. They, all their names start with A's, so if I get confused, just don't blame me. It's their fault. Uh, yeah, you guys want to get started? Hello, I'm Andrew Spearin, creative director of New World Interactive. Uh, I'm from Canada, and we just opened a studio here in Amsterdam. Um, Insurgency is a highly competitive game, so there's a few core features like you would have seen the last presentation, but as soon as we get those in, we'll be really leveraging our esports. Hey, uh, I'm Arne, uh, I'm with ESL, and uh, I take care of strategic relations. Um, that sounds very good, I know. Uh, I also look into uh, the technology side of what we do, um, and we do have a couple of tools and things that, we, that actually help developers and publishers uh, grow into esports. Hi, my name is Alex Nietzsche-Porczyk. Uh, I'm uh, one of the founders of TinyBuild. Uh, we're an indie publisher slash developer slash partnership house. Um, and the reason I'm on this panel is because one of our games has recently been accepted into the ESL, wink wink, thanks for that. Um, and Speedrunners is a game and it's really competitive and we're now trying to grow that as like an indie sport because we see the competitive side of it being the most entertaining to watch and that brings us most users. So that's why I'm here. Now you also are, are threatening us, right? I was at a panel earlier and uh, I noticed there's a bottle, there's a drink down here. And yeah, agree, uh, I don't like boring panels. Yeah, so he, he doesn't like panels. He thinks they're boring. So uh, I think, I, I don't know, which bottle is it? Is it yeah, this one? Yeah, it's, it's, it's that one. So I, I think let's just put it on stage over here. Uh, yeah, like, you know, so. It's a centerpiece. So uh, whenever um, anyone agrees with anyone and doesn't like provide an interesting argument, you know, like if it's, ah, I agree, then you have to drink a shot of that. Cool? I think it's brilliant. Uh, no. no okay. Uh, it's OK. He'll cover you. He can drink for two. I'll take yours, yeah. He agrees. I disagree. This is my first panel, so I'm going to need it. <laughs> All right, cool. So in case of pain, thing, you drink. <laughs> All right, well, let's see if we agree on anything. Um, let's, uh, I think, like, let's start with like, the more, most controversial thing that I actually brought up in our little conversation before uh, when we were on email. Um, when, when I look at eSports, I see a, a thriving market, but I also see one that reminds me in a very vague way of the way um, action sports were uh, kind of marketed in the 90s. I pointed to rollerblading. And I don't know if you guys remember rollerblading as like, a, uh, as like a sport in the 90s, as like this thing where it's like, oh, look at all these cool guys doing all this cool stuff. And it was really all funded by the people that made rollerblades. And I'm wondering, did you guys see any similarities here? And is esports and, and, and indie esports more authentic than that? Or is it at risk of kind of being this just this marketing thing that's funded by companies. Um, yeah, let me let me start uh, to disagree. Actually, um, <laughs> I, I don't see any similarities. To be honest, um, I mean, you have new transports and whatever f funny name they come up with, like uh, extreme sports, coming up every year. Whenever there's like a sports convention uh, or a big sports show, they come up with new transports and trying to, you know. Uh, establish their sports because they have a new uh, tool um, to sell. I think esports is different and also which uh, something that has not been uh, discussed a lot uh, during uh, this event yet is that when we talk about esports it's very much generalizing uh, something that is happening right now where people start um, you know not only playing competitive games but also enjoy watching them and we talk about individual games so when we talk about esports, it's a general, a very general term for having individual games it's developed like, by the the developers. What the hell is esports, right? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's one game by one game by one game. So someone who watches Counter Strike Go does not necessarily enjoy watching League of Legends or Dota 2. Um, so it, it's very difficult generalizing the term esports, and some people just throw out numbers um, because uh, it's a big hype at the moment. But it's more than that. It's, it's very individual. And I think that's the way uh, we should look at it. I, th I think uh, in terms of indie esports, no one knows what the hell that actually means. Uh, 
Uh, it's like you just, you know, in the esports. Uh, my game is competitive multiplayer, so I'm gonna try to make it uh, esports. But the only reason uh, Speedrunners was even like you know considered to be a competitive game is because last summer we were just about to release it. We're like, okay, feature complete, let's release out of early access, call it good. But then we stumbled upon videos of uh, really like the top players pulling up stunts that we didn't know. And then one of the updates that was leading up to launch, we just slightly changed the, the collision physics, and then the whole community just goes apeshit on us. They go like, what have you done? And then we look at those videos and we realize that the game had an incredibly higher skill cap than we thought. So uh, then we started designing a game around that skill cap. But uh, like, how the hell do we actually monetize that? You know, it's a premium game, right? So we don't have any in-app purchases or anything like that. So the only monetization we can think of is if a lot of people just watch it, watch the top players, and then buy into the game. But then the question becomes, like, how do we continue the monetization there in order to reinvest that? So I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg here, really. Like, uh, the rejuvenation of esports uh, really started what when, uh, I think, the biggest hit started when uh, Riot came out with League of Legends, which was a free game, and then they, as a publisher, backed the tournaments. That didn't happen a lot. Then we have the International, which is also a Valve-backed event. Um, and those things like really keep things afloat. But uh, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. Like I just briefly saw the MLG story. But uh, when MLG went under, um, that was because of sponsorship deals falling through or something like that? Partially. They, I think it was a long time coming uh, for that. But it, just, uh, it just shows like when I was into esports 10 years ago as a student organizing small LAN events, uh, it was heavily sponsor dependent. You can never cover mm -hmm. the cost of an event from just the participation fees. And then uh, the amount of people we had listening on the radio with HLTV, uh, that, that was a couple of hundred people, which you know, was a good inception. But then it felt like everything fell down a little bit. But now we are in this rapid growth phase where esports is being used as a buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's like four years ago, we're sitting here, invest in social games, and now invest in esports or VR. Yeah, I mean, you guys are kind of, kind of edging into this with insurgency, right? Because uh, it's a game sort of built for this sort of thing. How are you guys approaching esports as an indie developer? Well, as an indie, we have no choice but to build from the ground up rather than try to have that attitude of top down imposition. Which is the idea of esports as marketing. This is our plan from the beginning. Right. Right? Yeah, like, kind of like in the 90s, like you said, the rollerblades thing. Well, I don't remember as very young, but. Um, <laughs> 30, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just turned 32. Mm -hmm. So, But um, yeah, that, that attitude is probably the CEO or marketing guy said, hey, let's create a league for rollerblades. They'll sell a million more rollerblades if we have this whole structure in place. Um, it's kind of like building that, but then not having any demand. So I think also in the game world, uh, just a couple of days ago, like the CEO of Activision said, like, there's six to seven billion dollar opportunity with esports for Activision, based upon you know the frame of reference of the NFL or something like that. So their their lens is so much broader, and they're kind of trying to frame esports within that big business mentality. Whereas the difference for us is we started with zero and zero dollars, zero players, and we've had to earn every single one, and along the way shifted our direction design wise or, or business wise. So it's kind of like that more organic growth where we get to a point where there's the demand for competitive, so we are building for competitive, rather than trying to build the demand from our side. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. But. No, that, that, that does, and I think that maybe le leads into the ESL, where you see a developer like this kind of building from the ground up, uh, and we just got done with, with David's panel talking about like some of the best design decisions you can make as an indie developer trying to build an eSport. What, when you see a developer trying something like that, what, what are you guys thinking at ESL? What are you thinking, how can we help, and, 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 and things along those lines? First of all, uh, we love it um, because I think esports, and using this general term again, needs new games and uh, to attract new audiences and, and also to fulfill the expectations of everybody and not just the people who like MOBAs. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the, we, we usually start talking to developers um, at a pretty early stage and help them with the stuff that you've uh, just seen uh, that David presented, like the general steps you have to take um, if you have esports in mind. But we also try to remind them that you cannot just develop an esports game because um, you, you don't go to esports, but esports comes to you. Mm -hmm. um, so the community in the end will decide whether your competitive game will uh, become like more than that, will become esports, will be watched 
massively and may even get into uh, offline events. So there's a long way, there's a long road um, to esports. And from our perspective, we're trying to help uh, developers getting there, but uh, we can only help. We cannot you know, make decisions for the developers. So if the developers don't have a plan in mind, um, mm. uh, they cannot succeed anyway. Well, we kind of came in from the other side to this problem, right? So you just said that uh, it will transcend into offline at some point, right? We actually started with offline events. We just started uh, partnering up uh, early last year. Uh, we started partnering up with every single like Comic-Con style event we could find in the US if it had a couple of thousand people. And then we would just uh, tell them, all right, we have this game. You just need one PC, four controllers, that's it. And then it will become like the light of your show and we'll send you prizes. Here's how you host tournaments. It's very easy. And uh, we started building up this network, right, where we just ship prizes to every single event of people that then become the competitive online players. Because they're the ones that go to these local events that are like the super enthusiastic ones. And we use that as a lead-in for the core of the community, amongst other things. And because of that, we got a ton of contacts with you guys, like from the US. And then we had like this deal where we get uh, ESL, well, speedrunners into ESL. But uh, by doing so, we also did the, the bottoms up approach, you know, like where, hey, let's also do esports, by the way. But that is now causing a lot of issues that I really wish we had thought about earlier, like replays, like live spectatorship, like uh, making sure that your goddamn game is not peer to peer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so now when we host uh, like official tournaments, we just spin up a dedicated server and custom setup and then stream from that machine. But those are all of the things I really wish we had thought about before. I mean, that kind of brings up an interesting point. Uh, I mean, should developers even, I mean, you said you wish you thought about it before, but if had someone come up and told you that you need to be working on this, would you have believed them that that you needed to be thinking about esports uh, in this so way? I would be like the, the, in the example of the feature of the replay, right? Um, I, I wish we had that regardless of the esports mm -hmm. part, but it's one of the features that is directly relevant to esports, right? Because people want to make replays, people want to make spectator modes out of those replays, uh, and then GIFs. And then the GIFs part, or just sharing your really cool moments, that's what makes a competitive game shine, and that would not hurt marketing in any way, that would actually make the marketing of the game much better if people would be able to easily share their replays. Like Rocket League, when they launched with their, like, you know, the capture system, when you can share your goal, that was one of the main drivers for me to continue playing that. Because I see another GIF on Reddit, and I go, like, wow, you can actually do that? I'll put up Rocket League tonight again. So I think we should uh, kind of shift to maybe talk about what, we're talking about how developers can approach esports, but what can they expect to sort of get from esports? Uh, is there, is there a real tangible benefit, or is it this nebulous thing where it's like, well, it's going to satisfy this one part of this crowd, and then that will spread out to sort of some other crowds that like to watch our game? Uh, does it turn into like cash, I guess is what I'm saying? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, our game is you go on Steam, you pay $14.99, you've got the game, and we give you free content from there forward. We don't have microtransactions, nothing, none of that, and our community loves it. Um, we've had memes on Reddit gaming thread This is good good game, uh, New World Interactive, you know, celebrating our free content approach. So having that alternative revenue stream once we have the whole esports ecosystem in place surrounding our community is just opening up kind of revenue for us, which we can get all that we need. I mean, but that money, is that coming from people see the game and then they go and buy, the, buy it themselves, or is there some other money coming in from, from esports? Well, hopefully it's all, also coming from the existing community base, because a lot of them like say take my money like give me something to pay you for because they feel like they got more than their value out of the fifteen dollars or less if it's from a bundle or on sale or anything so a lot of it is kind of like that um, 80 20 rule perhaps like eighty percent of your revenue comes from twenty percent of your mm -hmm. audience so that might apply more so w within that esports and scene of the game the idea is the esports is keeping that that twenty percent around longer right? hopefully <laughs> I did. So, but you said that the, the, they want to pay you for stuff. What else are they paying you for? I mean, you said you don't, they don't, the game doesn't have microtransactions. So, so what else are they paying for? Are they paying for, uh, like, you know, DLC in some other way? Like, how is that working? Uh, well, we built kind of a, a game that is uh, also doubles as a modding platform. So, for example, last December when we opened up our studio here in Amsterdam, uh, eight of us in a room that typically have been working remotely, we have a team of 30 who work primarily remotely, uh, got together and we just made a World War II mod, total conversion to prove our modding system and released that in January. So within a month we released that to our audience on Workshop and a free mod and 100,000 subscribers in two weeks. So 
being able to act really quickly on that, and we can put in the competitive gameplay from the base game into that mod. So just, they were also saying and demanding, like, hey, we'll pay you for this. Stop giving us free stuff. Like, put it standalone, and we'll give you more money. So you're building goodwill with this community that really appreciates that, and that could eventually convert to a point where you guys are like, okay, well, then this thing that we really did work on for a long time, go ahead and pay us for this. That's kind of the, the, the plot line there. Yeah, I mean, this is our first game, uh, commercial title. Uh, it was a mod before that, so we are expanding, and we're actually going to have an announcement next week about other platforms. But um, that's kind of like the goal is to increase the visibility across the board as well. Yeah, adding to that, I think you can look at esports games as um, a marketing tool to enhance the life cycle of your game and, and create additional uh, ways to exploit it. Uh, but when you look at free-to-play um, esports games, it's actually a, a, a business model. It's um, trying to develop a game that will have a life cycle that is so much longer than the life cycle of any regular game. Once you, you have the community and once you have the audience, uh, you can keep going for many, many years. Look at uh, CSGO, which is based on the old Counter-Strike. The game has been there forever. Um, and it's still working. It's, you know, it, the audience is engaged and it's still something you can, uh, you know, like monetize and make money with just because they embrace the, uh, the business model um, free to play for. It's not even, CSGO is not even free to play because oh, you have this the only small reason free to, uh, The only reason CSGO took off is uh, when they introduced uh, the uh, skins for the weapons. That yeah. was like the turning point when everyone got back exactly. all of a sudden. And there were a lot of case studies on like uh, why the hell did this happen uh, and the common consensus that, uh, well, People like stars. Stars like to show off, and then everyone wants to be a star as well. So then the whole uh, aspect of like you know you put a sticker on your gun that becomes really cool because then you pick up someone else's gun and you go oh this is kind of cool and I want to show off. And we've been like looking at that for a while in the uh, in in speeders we um, for the ESL tournaments we just give all of the winners of ESL tournaments special in-game trails that are not moddable or available for anyone. So now these people really want the trails and that's why they play in the ESL. So I think like um, uh, the way to commercialize uh, an esports game, at least from you know like an indie game that people buy once and then uh, continue playing, is uh, do user-generated content and then use Valve's workshop to sell stuff. Just do that. It's not microtransactions, as in you know like not in the paywalls. It's just cosmetic items that people make and then sell on your shop, and you take a cut, Valve takes a cut, and the original creator takes a cut. So I think we're touching right now on uh, the idea of leveraging your community to help extend the, the, you know, the profitability, profitability of your game, of the popularity of your game. Um, I was at, uh, I don't know if he's here, but Peter Warman's uh, talk yesterday about eSports, and he, said, he pointed to like, the NFL as like, you know, this high mark, $60 per user. Um, eSports right now, somewhere like a couple bucks at the most. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff in that, in that gap um, between a couple bucks and sixty dollars, uh, is there anything in your guys' head that's even like thinking about how you guys can close that gap? Jersey sales, things like that, like you know, apparel, uh, all kinds of other products that to to make even more money from users, or is that too far of a reach? No, it's not. But you just have to um, look at who will actually have access to those different uh, income channels. And as, as Peter described yesterday, you have um, the, actually the, the game developers that have to have a sustainable business model for esports. You have the organizers um, like us. You have the teams. And all of those players have to have a business model and, and need to monetize. So um, yes, as a team, you can you know, monetize your brand. Um, you can uh, sell jerseys or hoodies or whatever. Um, I think you can do the same when you have a strong uh, games brand as well, um, but you have to, you know, come to a certain level where people actually appreciate that you do something else outside your game. So they, you really need to create a strong brand to get that kind of interest to, to sell real stuff. I think also uh, the business model is an open playbook here because um, esports is not by far not mature as a business. Like you guys have been around for a long time, but you've seen all of these tectonic shifts happening uh, a lot of the time, right? So, like, uh, what I really loved, uh, like during Steam Dev Days uh, a couple of years ago in Seattle, uh, they were talking about how uh, Dota monetizes the actual streams. 
It's like when you watch Dota, you can like, you know, uh, buy uh, something in the game that then gives everyone a happy feel. That's like, you know, additional consumables that impact the experience in a positive way. And uh, now seeing how Twitch is becoming like this, you know, the center of competitive sports streaming, um, you can do a lot of stuff with Twitch integration there. You can like, you know, betting is a big thing that can be going, not with real money, but with some sort of points or something like that. Um, then uh, doing stuff like where uh, the players can like somehow uh, decide on what is going to happen next. All of those are unexplored avenues. And then the first company that figures out a really cool way to monetize that, that that's where the, the gaps are going to start to bridge. So I'm wondering, we, we have sort of uh, the established esports that we've kept, we kept touching on, Dota, uh, CSGO, um, and that we have, it, you've talked about your, your indie games and how they are working inside of esports. Is there a difference between what you're doing and what, and what they're doing, uh, you know, either of you guys? I think, well, first of all, with indie games, there is uh, this whole issue of uh, timelines. You know, I, I'm going to spend a year on my game, and then two and a half years later, they're like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to release next year. Um, it, it's very difficult to, for at least indie companies, to align uh, initiatives with larger companies. And I've seen that happen like multiple times when you know, like uh, you, you have stuff lined up for the launch, but then you know the launch doesn't happen. I, I think that's like a major factor that uh, indies need to embrace to do esports is like, hey, if you, if you say it's going to be done, it has to be done. And then uh, be able to like negotiate partnerships, right? Because it, unfortunately, that's the reality of business, right? You have to be able to negotiate, you have to follow up with stakeholders, you have to like make stuff happen and actually like answer emails. Whereas with, with the indie community, when you have like two, three people working on a game, it's very difficult to do that alongside managing your own marketing, alongside, you know, actually finishing the game. Yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of lessons to learn from the big successes, but also you can't look at them as the whole and try to get to that destination without taking your own steps there as an indie. Um, we get a lot of demand from our communities, say, make it more like Counter-Strike Go or put in a bomb defusal game mode. And we say, well, that's what Counter-Strike does. So we want to differentiate ourselves and develop new gameplay that is more uh, you know, spectator friendly, that kind of thing. Uh, it's just something different in general. So. Um, I mean, all these big companies took a whole bunch of little steps to get there. So if you're so focused on the end result, you're never going to really understand what it took to get to that point. So. And I mean, uh, in the last panel, we heard that you should be listening to your community, uh, but clearly you can't listen to everything because I mean, they would direct you into be becoming something that maybe you're not. Um, how do you sort of parse that noise and, and also like once they start saying, hey, you are an eSport, we are treating you like an eSport, how do you know that and how can you take that seriously? We were fortunate enough to be one of the first uh, early access games on Steam, so uh, we took a very iterative approach and feedback approach to our game development right from day one. And since launching out of that, which by necessity was good running out of money, we got to launch the game now, uh, may not have been entirely complete, but since then we just kept that model going and getting that feedback. And there have been uh, leagues, I mean, ESL has, I think it's now the, like the 37th cup, uh, community cup, which is completely volunteer driven from our players. And uh, there's another league called the DGL, which has cropped up uh, with our players, with our gameplay. And they do have some very specific requests, but we take it as uh, we're building a platform for you. So we have to think, take that specific request and think of it as a system. Okay, how do we design the system to appease that specific request? Um, the, other, the other side of it is the method of delivery. So sometimes if they find an exploit in the game and they'll post a video on Reddit and be like, hey, your game's broken, it's like, well, that's not very professional. You could just <laughs> told us privately and try to, instead of the attempt to publicly embarrass. So that kind of hurts the, the, the relationship in a little bit. Um, but overall, you know, we're, we're open. We know that p these people are extremely passionate. They're competitive. They get fired up about what they do. And we just need to facilitate that. And when you got, how, do you, how do you help facilitate that? Is there, is there something that you would step in here and, and say, hey, this is what we can help with? Um, absolutely. I mean, a lot of feedback um, that we give is actually out of the experience of working with the community. Um, and uh, the difficult part, especially for, for indie developers, is that um, you need the community to, to grow. You need to listen to a community, like you said. You need to get them involved, actively involved. And at one point, when you actually grow, um, 
the balance will shift a little bit because you will still need those people. They are like accelerators. They they um, have a word. But um, as the community grows, um, things will change. So they will get less vocal, um, but they will st still try to be vocal because they've been there from the, from the very first beginning. They've been like almost a part of the game and they actually feel they have been part of the game. So some of them even feel they've been part of the development team. Um, so you need to start balancing from you know working very directly with the community to working more broad with the community. And I think this is something where we can support and can help because that's what we've done uh, for many, many times. And we have a big, you know, um, uh, a bunch of people actually, m many, many people in the community that work for us as administrators. So they are, you know, like we have chosen people in the community that represent uh, the community on both sides, on the ESL side and the community itself. And while not every uh, developer has um, the resources and the capabilities of doing that, because yeah, you're only like four people, five people, um, this is where we can help and we can support. Uh, I think an important thing that we didn't mention here at all is the fact that esports uh, usually um, it attracts a lot of audiences when they're interesting personalities. So as soon as you have like this, the StarCraft players that you know just rage and like talk crap in the, in the chat. Uh, of course, sponsors don't like that, but that's what makes me interested a lot in uh, those players. And I think that's actually I've been thinking, like uh, sitting here, thinking, why don't I watch esports as often right now as I used to when I played StarCraft? And that's because um, just you know in five versus five games, it's difficult for the personalities to stand out. And like the first generation of uh, professional Counter Strike players or you know uh, Warcraft players, they're now you know older, so they don't play competitively anymore. And then the new generation of players just focused on the game, whereas it used to be like common to talk smack at each other, and that was really funny. And then there were like legendary matches where like a StarCraft pro just rage quits because there is. Uh, the enemy had two uh, two colossus, but then he made two ghosts or two illusions of the colossus and just made a bluff, stampeding the map. And then the other guy that was talking to me just rage quits, and then he automatically loses the match. And those were stories that resonated and attracted that audience. So as soon as you have those kind of stories in your community, where someone like two top players talk smack at each other, and you know it gets really ugly in the chat with like name calling, you just go, okay, kids, kids, you just fight that. You know, <laughs> well, we'll make a spectacle out of it. And guess what? People watched. And people were like uh, voting like for one or the other, and like it was shifting back and forth, and people were cheering in the chat. That was great. That's how you know. This actually does bring up an interesting point. You, you were talking about how these personalities sort of uh, make a name for themselves and then in turn make money. Uh, I've spoken with a few uh, pro gamers, and they say, you know, we play these competitions, we practice all day, but where I'm really making money is making videos on YouTube, talking about the game. Or, or streaming on streaming on Twitch, but personally streaming, just showing myself practicing. That's where I'm making, getting my, my real paychecks from. And if I miss a day of, if I go out to a competition and I don't make a video for a day or two, you know, I'm all I'm thinking about is how I'm not getting paid for that day. Uh, so it, it, I, I wonder if we can like maybe kind of walk through the chain of how everyone gets paid in esports. We touched on this a little bit as well or earlier, where. You know, we have the teams that need to make money, the, the game developers need to make money, the organizers need to make money. Let's, let's start from the bottom. Like, where are the gamers that play these games, where are they making their money? So, um, I, I just very briefly, I was a pro gamer 10 years ago, and back then the scene didn't exist, so I didn't make any money. <laughs> and the only hope was that you can make enough, like, from your entry into the LAN event on the weekend, that you would, like, get the top five paid spots just to pay back for your entry. That was it. Sponsorships, everyone looked at that, everyone was like, ninjas in pajamas, oh my god, those are gods. But then you realize <laughs> that they actually don't make that much money either. How has it changed recently? Um, it has changed and it keeps on changing. And I think one very good reason for that is that you have so many more possibilities of exploiting your own personality mm -hmm. and of you know being out there and being followed. Um, we had the YouTubers and streamers discussion earlier um, today. And I think that's um, because of the technical possibilities, but also because we have some uh, very general prof professionalization uh, in this space. So teams have actual managers um, that care about finding sponsors, that care about you know positioning the players in a proper way so they, they can be seen in a certain way by the audience and probably also develop characters. 
in that sense. Um, so um, we're seeing something that happened in like, um, call it regular traditional sports long time ago, we're seeing a professionalization. And if you compare how um, football players have been seen like 20, 30 years ago um, to how they've been perceived today, that's a huge difference. Um, and they make much more money nowadays because um, ex of exactly that. There's more possibilities of you know, selling your personalities and there's just more ways of uh, getting into the pockets of the audience. I mean, there's also, uh, like, uh, I was just listening to one of the podcasts last week, uh, I don't remember who was home, but uh, they were talking about esports and how, like, um, people are realizing in esports organization that's all about the entertainment part and how it's, like, very similar to wrestling. Like, uh, you know, by now everyone knows that it's all fake, but then they go like so many steps beyond to making it fake. Like, you know, the, the personalities all like have feuds on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, like before an upcoming match. And then the fans follow, you know it's fake, but you still watch, right? Uh, Though esports tournaments are not fake, right? <laughs> yeah, so in esports, that's a, the difference, right? The actual competitive part is uh, that's like very serious. You have to like practice and be really good at what you do. But then the entertainment piece around that, like, I think oh, as, yeah. as soon as you try to facilitate that in one way or another, or you know, if you want to just go full on wrestling uh, with everything being fake, it's still entertaining to watch. And that's what's missing. Like for me, um, I, I played Dota before it became like Dota 2, right? So I played the Warcraft 3 mod. And uh, now whenever I boot it up, I, I just can't really, you know, understand exactly what's going on. Uh, and whenever I watch, uh, if I see a character that I really like, a personality, then I'll just watch them and just watch the reaction and then, you know, learn the game along the way. And actually, if, if you've ever been to, like, a, a big um, esports event, like an arena event, you will just be, you know, uh, astonished by the atmosphere that you actually have in those uh, arenas, where people are so excited and there's such enthusiasm going on that even the people that never had any interest in esports is sitting there and, uh, like, Goosebumps and like, wow, what's the going pressure, on here? Like, you know, when they're one versus one, and like, yeah. are they gonna win? And then when everyone cheers, yeah, that. And you is don't amazing. even have to understand the details of the game, like Dota 2, which is very complex anyway. But you you realize, you know, sometimes I just I sit there and I'm looking at my phone and I feel the tension in the stadium, and I look up and I, people are all like getting super excited, and it just it just pulls you along, and it it's like a whole weekend of excitement. It's it's really uh, if. Any of you haven't had a chance to go, just go and feel it because it's, it's really going to change your mindset on, on esports. So these, these guys are sort of pulling you along. They're making their, their personalities and they're making their, their money from, like, I mean, you kind of put it kind of plainly. You like watching them react to other stuff and that's actually where they're making most and of their money. And I'll like, follow them to their YouTube channels yeah, you, and to their Twitch channels. And they're, they're monetizing that very successfully. Now, as developers, uh, we'll just kind of half, we'll move a half step, step up the chain do you guys feel responsibility for whether or not they make money from your competitive games? Like, do you guys, are you concerned about them making enough if they're trying to put, like, throw all their time into, into this, this competition, this game? Do you feel like, not necessarily that you need to be paying them, of course, but like, do you feel like, well, we should kind of make sure that they are getting some sort of reimbursement for their time that they're putting into this? So I actually haven't thought about in monetary terms, mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting perspective that you put on that. Uh, what we have been always thinking about is making sure that whenever the top players like make show off videos or something that we would promote that in the game and by doing so we make sure that they get like YouTube hits or viewers uh, in terms of like actual monetization like uh, I think it was in the esports it's more difficult to have someone just specialize in that one game um, and just constantly keep on playing it uh, versus just having it like, you know, a weekly speedruns or insurgency match, you know, something like that. Uh, it's difficult to have someone like so deeply vested that they would make it their full-time gig. Yeah, I think you see a lot of support for each other, especially in the beginning of uh, when a game like grows into esports, so people really support each other. But everyone involved has to take care of their own, you know, like, business model and way of how to make money with that um, as they will do later on as well and uh, there's also a big opportunity for someone who will uh, support a game from the very uh, early beginning and this game is going to grow and it's going to become big he may just be the you know the flagship uh, youtuber or streamer on a certain game and be seen like as a 
as a personality of that game. So there's a big opportunity of like being the first, um, but also being the best uh, in the end. Like it's pretty tough as an indie to facilitate the the money part of things, but we can we can use exposure. You know, there's other value propositions for them. Um, yeah, like, could, or would you like just say make it clear we're going to stand out of your way. We're not going to you know put copyright strikes on your videos and stuff like that. We yeah. want you guys out there being part of our community, and this is part of it. We're going to facilitate you any way we can. Yeah. Make money from our game if if possible. Is that right. kind of yeah? We're going to be the enablers for them to keep doing what they do. Um, in our game, like as soon as you open the game, there's in-game news. So uh, my background previous to games was a photojournalist and worked in the news world. So um, that's kind of like every time they open something, there's something fresh. And we put in the competitive news and we say, hey, the ESL is having their next cup next week. Here's where you go sign up. And meanwhile, the DGL is also doing their North American things. And here's pickup games for new, new players to join in. So we're really facilitating that. And you know, even though we do have like a very limited budget when it comes to like especially marketing and that kind of that kind of thing, um, or we invest in development. So, like right now, we're investing in development specifically for matchmaking, for tournaments, all these you know core features uh, to have a successful esports title. We're investing in that in the development side of things, and then once it's all ready, we can put our limited marketing dollars towards that side of thing rather than, for example, like free content. So we'd be promoting more of like the league, the competitive videos, live streaming it ourselves. We do a, a weekly live stream. Uh, our community manager, who's also the voice actor in the game, and very charismatic figure, Mikey, uh, he live streams every week. So, uh, and what we have to do is we highlight like mod, mod makers or people from the competitive community and interview them and play the game with them. And so just creating that kind of buzz and enabling all that will kind of trickle down the value for, for those base players. That makes sense. So then. We kind of we've talked a little bit how the developers make money from esports. It's still kind of nebulous. It's still kind of marketing. It's still kind of uh, this thing about generating excitement. Uh, but then when we move up again to to the organizers, where are you guys making money in this process? Yes, yeah, so the majority uh, actually comes from sponsorships. Mm -hmm. um, is like again like in any other sports where we um, we utilize. Um, the audience that we attract, whether that's online or at events, um, to actually um, promote um, like sponsored products uh, or services. So this is where um, the main money comes from. And then, and then this kind of, again, goes back to what David was saying uh, uh, and kind of what we were just talking about, the responsibility that you might feel towards developers. I got the sense that from that talk that he was saying, you know, there's no way for us to like kind of directly make sure that you're making a ton of money from being an eSport and working with ESL, but you can potentially, if you follow some of these guidelines, is that sort of where your guys' responsibility towards developers comes, comes into play? That you want to make sure that they are making the best eSports game possible? I think that's, that's uh, going back to what I said before, is like um, you find partners that help you uh, getting where you want to get. Um, and that um, help you also find the way to success. So in some sense, we are such, such a partner because we can attract the audience, we can give the uh, publicity, and we can give the eyeballs. We can also help um, advising on how to do things and not to do things, our experience with certain games, with genres, with approaches um, towards the community. Uh, we also have technical tools, um, but in the end, if a developer um, is not living his game anyway and living it the right way, we cannot you know, change things for him. So a developer is still self-responsible for the game and that will mm -hmm. never change. And I think that's true for every player in the ecosystem. If a developer, if an organizer, if a YouTuber does not have a sustainable model, um, it's not going to succeed anyway. So just uh, piggybacking on somebody else's success is not a long-term uh, solution. So. Like, let's kind of look to the future now. Uh, we, we've kind of talked about what has brought indie esports to indie, indie esports to where it is today. Uh, what does it look like tomorrow in five years, ten years? Is it uh, always kind of going to kind of be this thing where it is sort of a way to promote your game, or is it going to be something more? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of hype around esports at the moment, uh, which is good. Um, in general, but uh, there's also a lot of people coming in that just, you know, throw around numbers and buzzwords um, without any, you know, 
experience or sustainable um, models behind that. I think you always had that and you will always have that. We've seen mobile being like a huge hype. We've seen free to play being a huge hype and it will always exist. There's, you know, it, there's no just black and white, but you just have to look at it from a probably more um, stable perspective. And uh, regarding the future of esports, I think it's going to be huge as the audience is only just developing and growing. Um, and perhaps in 10 years from now, um, we would look back at this day and say, ah, look at us, we've been like dinosaurs, we've been talking <laughs> stupid stuff about things that we didn't know anything of. It's like looking back in other sports um, types. Um, things will change rapidly and all, of our, all three of us sitting here, we have to like constantly look into those changes as they occur, day by day. Um, but none of us will be able to foresee uh, what esports is in five or ten years. Uh, the only thing I know is going to be huge. Well, it will most likely be huge. Uh, what I fear within the next five years, though, is like with any industry, you have you know the unicorns, right? That uh, a lot of investors bet on, you know, to become the next one billion dollar company. And now, when when there's a lot of hype around something like esports, VR, mobile, or Facebook, uh, then you have these you know a lot of capital being poured in, a lot of people who do not know the the nature of the industry that is constantly changing. Um, as soon as you have the first big major bust, like the dominoes are going to start falling, and that's when we find out if the market is actually you know there yet in terms of if there is a business model. Just because uh, whenever uh, we talk about sponsorship dependent business models, it means that you constantly have to have like a sales agency. You, ha you constantly have to have these agreements. You constantly have to renew them, etc. That's very um, unsustainable for a small company. Uh, for larger companies, that is, you know, like for uh, esports leagues, that's like the bread and butter, right? So you can manage that with a big sales team. But so far, the only uh, sustainable model that I see is when a publisher is directly backing an esport. Because they know that no matter what happens, they're going to profit. It's not like a, a side uh, company that is getting there. And then, yeah, it's really easy to get excited when you see all of the numbers, reports, like, hey, it's growing and exponentially, and you know, it's going to be like the next NFL and whatnot. But the nature of the business is very, very unpredictable. So I think within five years, I think uh, by that time we'll know what actually works in terms of a business model, and then within 10 years it, it might go mass market. I feel like the trend, even right now we can see, is um, esports prior to that has been an external organization kind of surrounding the games, and now, you know, in Dota 2, Valve makes the game, runs everything about it. So they, they own that whole whole piece. So for us as Indies, like we want to kind of hold a lot of the value of, of facilitating the, the actual esports for the game itself, you know, like whether it's entry fees or something, doing that right in the game and depending less upon those kind of external factors or ways to, to pay or, you know, get sponsorship, that kind of stuff. Uh, and since it's Ill illegal to have a panel without talking about virtual reality, uh, let's, just, let's just talk about it for like the last five minutes and then we'll probably take some uh, questions. Um, is, that, uh, is, is there any potential there for eSports? Is that maybe maybe a, a creating a new kind of spectator mode where people pay you know, five bucks to be able to sit in the front row seat of a virtual reality stadium for you know, digital, digital, digital sport? Is that I, I was really amazed at how good of an experience it is when you are sitting on a plane and you put on the Gear VR headset and then you're watching the same movie in theater. You know, you just turn on the, the air blower and you're like, you're sitting in cinema, you don't <laughs> mind. I think something like that is going to be part of it. Um, it's also, you know, like 30, 40 years ago in science fiction, everyone was forecasting that, yeah, we'll have these like VR headsets, we're going to run around in virtual reality. That hasn't happened yet. I still haven't gotten my Omni Mill, which I backed two years ago. <laughs> which is like you know the running mill. Uh, so that is probably not going to happen. But I think some sort of collaborative watching experience that that creates its own meta game. You know, like being in front of the screen and whatnot. Maybe not in that form exactly, but uh, who knows? It, I, I'm a believer in VR ever since I tried the HTC Vive. Like I tried the demo at Gamescom and I was like blown away. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy hell, this is actually going to work. But then the question is, the main, main question was VR uh, that I don't think many people ask, is if people are willing to rearrange their living room around VR. And that's what people did for the television. That's what people did for the radio. And then the fireplace before that. So that's, that's a big question. Also, you know, the money question. But we can talk about that as a separate panel. Um, I think we need to look at VR or AR from two uh, 
to uh, different perspectives. One is um, like us as a production company pr producing content and I think it will definitely play an important role in the future of enhancing the experience um, for people that cannot actually come to stadium events. So if, if you're at home you have an additional stream, additional information um, and just get a better experience. So um, if the hardware is there um, with the consumers, I think it's going to happen and we're going to support it. Um, that's, that's like a given. Um, and then there's the perspective uh, from a game developer, publisher um, standpoint, where um, f first we have to have those games um, come uh, and be successful. And I think this is going to take much longer um, than just adding a new experience um, to the uh, spectator. Yeah, it's always hard to say when it's still in concept phase, but I mean, I've tried the Oculus with uh, Eve Valkyrie, and that was a hell of an experience to fly a spaceship. Um, you create an eSport of that in itself, but it, I think VR is just kind of one of those parts in many other different uh, emerging kind of technology in our landscape right now, like um, spectating, you know, if you're on this Twitch stream and maybe everyone's typing in what camera or player to follow, that kind of thing. So maybe that combined with VR might be interesting, who knows. <laughs> is it just to seem like a headache to try to figure out how to make a spectator mode work? in VR in your game, would that just be like, oh, how do I move the play or the viewer from here to there without making them feel sick? And then it, how do I give them a good perspective on everything that's happening? Is that kind of just a, a headache in the making? It is when we have so much other stuff to focus <laughs> on right now. And um, I mean, VR is hopefully going to be big. I don't know, everyone says it will. I don't know yet. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes. Excellent. I think people really underestimate the first-person experience, and a really good example of that is GTA V. When it released on PC, it was a first-person uh, view mod, and then I played it. I was like, holy hell, this is a different game now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of games or experiences experienced from within like that first-person VR perspective are going to you know, be more interesting, and people really underappreciate that. Great. Well, I think we should probably take some questions. Um, if anyone has any, I think we got some microphones going around the room. Uh, let us know, and we'll do our best to answer. Actually, I have one. Because uh, um, I, I guess this one's directed uh, to you, Arna. Because you mentioned that uh, for esports, it's it's game by game, uh, a game by game experience where you know fans of viewing Counter Strike might not like watching other games. So, given that that's your your uh, observation, where do you see the center of gravity for the esports market moving? Do you see it fragmenting between individual game creators or a third party organization kind of having lots of games underneath for different types of gamers? Um, I think it's already fragmented, uh, fragmented today. Um, it just depends on how you approach um, the audience. So you have standalone events. Um, like from the publisher side, but also we do standalone events, and then we do events where we have several games. And you can clearly see that um, the audiences will just split up automatically and just primarily uh, enjoy the stuff that they like at or that they came for. And they do it online anyway, so um, that's like switching your TV channel. And then you have to address the audience that is on that channel or is like focusing on your game. and it's. It's a pre pretty common thing, so I wouldn't even, you know, it's not even a big discussion to me. Okay. Any other questions? Oh. So um, earlier in the presentation, you talk about the lack of personalities and strong development uh, regarding the the esports player, but. Um, I don't really uh, agree with that. I think it depends on the audience and maybe on the game, because on the Korean esports uh, scene, the the esports players are are really developed with the strong personalities. There's a lot of trash talk and there's a lot of competition between the players. So, do you think um, what what is the 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 factor that can develop such a, a development regarding the the star players? Uh, so when when one of your players is really, really good and much better than everyone else, uh, for some reason, quite often, it just so happens that, that guy is a dick online. <laughs> and then it becomes really funny. And because it's funny to other people, it gets, gets amplified. Um, it, 
it, it just kind of happens organically, right? And then th those kind of stories, they resonate and they attract more people. Like, I'm not, not sure if that answers your question, but I'm not sure how to facilitate those kind of trash talky people. They just have to, you know, emerge by themselves. Or you just fake it and, you know, make, make basically a wrestling match. So do you think it is a factor coming more from the game or more from the audience or the, the players? Uh, I think it, it, is, uh, it is always based around the community, right? Uh, because, uh, like, especially in early access games like uh, Speedrunners and Insurgency, you have this, the core community that was there from, like, day one. And they're the ones that are, like, after playing the game for 2,000 hours, they're, they're going to post a negative review. And then say that this game sucks, not worth the money. And then you know you bought it in a humble bundle for one dollar and played two thousand hours in it. Uh, so the community, there's some chemistry that goes on there. You have organic ambassadors that just suddenly appear. Then they start to moderate your forums and whatnot. But then there will be like a couple of people who like you know disagree because someone rage quit a match or did something like in the match that you know people don't want to do. Like in in the example of speedruns, we have a problem where the higher players they don't use items. So they, they're like, you know, there's like this verbal agreement between the top players. They don't use items when they play against each other. So whenever someone plays a game that how we intend it to be played, uh, everyone like groups up on that one player and then that one player just uses that, you know, to, to be funny and snarky online. Okay, thank you. Just real quick on that, it, when you do have that super good player that's kind of a dick, uh, should the developer like approach him and, or like support him in a, in a way or do you have to kind of stand back and just let him deal with things on his own uh, or do you step in and say, hey, maybe don't be a dick or, or what? Well, um, I usually, um, whenever such things handle, um, it can never get personal, like no personal attacks on the forum, uh, never like, you know, harassment or anything like that. If it's objective, you know, like, and if he's just being a prick, you know, it, it's fine. It, they'll, they'll work it out, right? Because what happened was our, like, top one prick is that uh, he won a lot of uh, matches that we hosted. Was like, you know, next to no competition, like, okay, this guy is the king. And then a guy from Canada comes in and wins eight to one. And the whole community was just in shock, like, seeing what the hell is happening here. And uh, that just that makes a story that this guy, you know, and now he's training again, and he's going to make a comeback. So we're going to host a match, like a re rematch with that Canadian guy. I think as developers, we have the responsibility to be the voice of reason amongst all that drama. <laughs> um, there is a lot of drama in our competitive community in particular, and they try to drag us into it and, you know, make us responsible for some things. But we're just like, chill out. And like, let's, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> let's, let's just not knee-jerk react every, everything and let's figure it out. Um, but we're very delicate at promoting those kind of hostile personalities. Um, not only because they directly attack our game and us as developers, but we just don't want that kind of community. Um, oh, they actually attack you. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right. We don't have that, so we didn't have that. We, we were like, you know, just trying to get the kid, kids to be in line. Well, some of it is like, you know, rules based or that kind of thing. And they, they lobby up against us. They're, they're like a lobby, you know, for yeah, government. Of course, yeah. They're lobbyists. And we're the developer. <laughs> we're the government. So we have to stay, you know, objective and diplomatic about everything. I get, um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll. Just, okay, then I think I'll ask you this last one and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, how, I mean, you said you got to be diplomatic, but uh, and when, when they're lobbying against you, like, but how do you sort of. Uh, how, how do you sort of address that when you decide to address it? Like, how, when you decide, hey, this, either we're going to go along with what you guys say or we're going to reject it, do you just ignore it or what? Usually we take it offline conversation uh, through, you know, instant messaging between the person, or it, using voice helps a lot. Uh, like our community manager, Mikey, he's amazing at, at talking people down. <laughs> he could be like a hostage negotiator or something. But, <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of them attempt to make a big public mm -hmm deal out of everything, create a big controversy, and then so we just approach them individually and speak to them and get them to speak back and understand where they're coming from and try to just, you know, diffuse it. So we, we have tried to avoid having that drama all over the community because it just puts a negative image on it overall. Excellent. Well, guys, I think this was a great chat. This was an excellent, great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.